All right, uh, let's go ahead and get it started. Uh, at first, I uh, warm welcome to you all on the second season of Core Modeling Thematic Webinars. Uh, my name is Pravin Rokaya. I'm the science coordinator of the Core Modeling and Forecasting team. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bruce Davison, uh, who is going to present a webinar on advances in current generation hydrological modeling. Uh, Bruce is a hydrologist and a water resources engineer at Environment and Climate Science Canada. Uh, as the head of the National Hydrological Services uh, Transboundary Water Unit for Western and Northern Canada, he and his team are responsible for ensuring that the number of Canada's obligations are met uh, with respect to interprovincial and international transboundary waters. Uh, Bruce's primary research expertise in, is in hydrometeorological modeling, uh, including incorporating physical and statistical processes into models, operationalization of modeling tools, incorporating software engineering tools into model development, and models used for decision making. In core modeling program, uh, Bruce is a theme leader of the current generation hydrological modeling theme. This theme, among others, uh, all improvement, provides moral support, and is generating climate change production runs for all major river basins in Canada. Uh, all right, uh, without taking much time, I want to kick off this webinar by uh, thanking Bruce uh, for accepting our invitation to present today. Uh, the webinar today would be about 45 minutes of presentation, uh, followed by 15 minutes of question and answer session. Uh, Bruce, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Pravin, and welcome everyone. I certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy days to listen to the the work that um, has been occurring with um, within the current generation hydrological modeling group within uh, within GWF. Um, so there's a lot of really fantastic work that's taking place. As uh, Pravin mentioned, the three areas that we're really focusing on with this group are first of all producing climate change production runs over seven drainage uh, seven major drainage basins in Canada. Uh, the second goal of our team is to upgrade the current generation hydrological models with the well-established hydrological science um, that had not previously been incorporated into some of these models. And then the third goal is to support the Global Water Futures current generation model users um, in their efforts, um, regardless of where they sit within the, the GWF uh, community. This is our, our team of HQP that are funded by, um, uh, by this core modeling group. And I have to say, this is a really fantastic group of people to work with. Um, there's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fantastic work that they're doing. And of course, none of what I'm presenting today would be possible if it wasn't for these, these individuals and the hard work that they've been putting in over the over the last few years on uh, on the work for uh, for the current generation hydrological modeling team. So I want to thank all of the individuals here for their um, their efforts. The team is actually a little bit larger than this. We have interactions with um, with other folks as, as well. This is just the list of people who are actually funded through um, through the core modeling. Starting off with the um, the production runs the the um, the approach I'm going to take with this presentation is going essentially basin by basin. Uh, I will also be touching on a number of the improvements that have been made uh, and are being made in the current generation hydrological models as we go through the um, through the basins. And I do want to start with the work that Sujata, Prabhan, and, and Carl have done um, in terms of the impacts of uh, future climate on the hydrology of the St. John River Basin. Um, this is uh, uh, work that's really providing a template for the rest of our team for how to uh, um, uh, push forward on producing those production runs. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the basin, it is located in the eastern part of the continent. It is a, an international basin between Canada and the U.S. 36% uh, of the basin is in the United States in, in the state of Maine, 13% uh, in the province of Quebec, and 51% in the province of New Brunswick. The drainage area itself is uh, around 55,000 square kilometers, but the area that we're modeling is a bit smaller than that, 41,000 square kilometers, just to the city of Fredericton, uh, just because uh, MESH does not deal with uh, tidal flows very well. You really need a specialized hydrological model to, um, 
deal with uh, tides. And also the observations that we have are very good up until Fredericton. So we're able to capture the um, uh, the bulk of the basin without having to uh, worry about the tides uh, um, that uh, that lead into the uh, into the ocean. One of the key points that I want to illustrate, and this this is something that Sujata did with her work, is she did a, a, a very thorough analysis of different forcing data sets in the basin. And this is something that we have been doing and are doing with other basins um, across Canada as well. Um, and I just want to take a moment to describe uh, some of these forcing data sets because this really is the crux of one of the major challenges that we have in producing the, the production runs. Um, the forcing data really incorporates um, one of the biggest uncertainties in the, in the modeling chain, which is the mainly the precipitation input, but also some of the other inputs as well. So that first um, row there, gem cap, I know many of you are familiar with this. I think of this as the operational version of our best estimate of precipitation, temperature, and the other forcing variables that MESH requires, such as the incoming shortwave and longwave radiation, among others. Uh, and that data set is available from 2002 until the, the present. The, the length that Sujata was looking at was until 2019. And that product is one that uses the best available numerical weather prediction model at the time and real time uh, availability of uh, the ground based precipitation observations in the development of Kappa. So one of the challenges with respect to GEM and Kappa is that as the model improves or the resolution changes or they incorporate uh, different ground based observations it creates an inconsistency in the, um, in the overall time series from uh, the beginning to, to the end. So just as an example, um, I've forgotten the exact year when they upgraded the resolution of Kappa from 15 kilometers to 10 kilometers. But prior to that time period, uh, it, was, uh, it was the 15 kilometer version that we're accessing. And after that time period, it's 10 kilometer version that we're accessing. And the model is periodically upgraded, so uh, there's an inconsistency across the um, across the time series uh, that can cause some problems. However, when we started this initiative with the current generation modeling team, uh, that really was the best available uh, um, forcing data set for uh, for the models. Uh, another approach is to do something called a reanalysis, and the second line here is uh, is this Wafti product is a European reanalysis product that goes back further in time, and that was developed from 1979 to 2016. And this reanalysis helps to overcome some of the issues associated with what I mentioned with GEM and Kappa. So they use one version of the numerical weather prediction model, the most up-to-date version that is stable, and they're able to incorporate more ground-based observations that aren't necessarily available in a real-time basis. However, the Europeans don't quite have the same access to the, the Canadian and US data that, that we have. Um, but um, uh, this, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Canadian efforts to produce a reanalysis uh, later on in this slide. But with respect to um, getting the best available forcing data set for both the historic period and future period for the climate runs, um, Earlier on uh, through the University of Saskatchewan, this Wafti reanalysis product was bias corrected to GEM and Kappa. And then that product was used to bias correct the downscaled regional climate model, um, the CAN-RCM4, uh, uh, both for the historic time period and the future time period, which gives us a time series from 1950 to 2100. Uh, that uh, is consistent across the whole time series and is both downscaled and bias corrected. Um, there are, of course, issues with this, and there's definitely room for improvement. But in terms of capturing at least some of the uncertainty associated with what might happen in the future, this is one of the better products that we have available to us at the moment for the production runs. This last line here, the RDRS is Environment and Climate Change Canada's Regional Deterministic Reforecasting System. 
This is being developed um, with our colleagues in Montreal, and we currently have a publication out um, and the data available from 2000 to 2017. That data set is um, being produced from uh, 1980 to the present day as well. So um, that's something that uh, we're really looking forward to. And our initial results, and you'll see some of them here in this presentation, indicates to us that this RDRS really is our best estimate of the historic um, precipitation and um, other forcing variables across the large spatial domains that we're looking at in, um, in, our, uh, in our climate change production rooms. So getting back to the work that uh, Sujata has done, um, she did a calibration of all four of these data sets um, for the St. John River Basin. And just looking at these the calibration and validation statistics of the Nash Sutcliffe and the log of the Nash Sutcliffe, it's pretty obvious right away that the RDRS um, gives you better values for these uh, these statistics. Uh, the second best ones are the uh, GEM and Kappa. Um, and what we really are, are considering, or what we need to consider for the production runs is the Wafti GEM Kappa, because that's what um, was used to bias prep the, uh, the downscaled um, regional climate model runs. Uh, and I just showing some of the hydrographs here, uh, just to illustrate that it's generally capturing the, the, uh, the trends uh, just um, in a, um, a very qualitative uh, sense here. And then you've got the numbers, of course, for the, uh, for the statistics. That's not to say that there aren't some uh, challenges with, uh, with these data sets. So here um, you can see some box whisker plots that uh, show some analysis that we really need to do before we do any future climate simulations. We need to get a better understanding of how the model performs under the baseline period using the downscaled and bias corrected um, climate simulations. So here we've got some Bosque whisker, whisker plots for the discharge at two locations in the basin um, from 1991 to, to 2020. Uh, the left box for each month is, the, uh, is for the observed flows for each month. And then the, the blue box right beside it for each month is from the uh, simulations, which uh, really represent um, 15 uh, scenarios, the ensemble of uh, 15 members that we were working with, as well as 10, 10 parameter sets each. And there's a couple of things that become obvious when you look at the data this way. Um, the first is that the variability is much less in the simulations than it is in the observations. And the second is that there are um, issues in particular with uh, underestimating the spring flows in April and May uh, for both of these both of these locations. So the question comes as to what, why why does this happen? Where do these errors come from? And uh, one way to look at this is um, to look at uh, the observations compared to Wafti Gem Kappa for these two stations and for the RDRS. So the Wafti Gem Kappa for the two stations are the plots on the left and for the RDRS are on the right. And again, these are monthly discharges. So you can see that um, the product, the Wafti Gem Kappa product that was used to bias correct the RCM underestimates uh, the discharge in April and May. And then of course that bias uh, spills over into the bias correction that occurs for the, the CAN RCM4. And uh, that, that's some uh, really good analysis that illustrates where, where this bias is coming from. When we look at the same plots using the RDRS um, that has the latest version of Environment Canada's numeric weather prediction model and a broader range of ground-based observations that are used to um, inform the development of the uh, precipitation estimates in particular, uh, you can see that those biases don't, uh, don't exist there. So um, that's where uh, at some point down the road, perhaps one option would be for us to bias correct some of these regional climate models with the, with the RDRS as a way forward for um, future steps in our climate change simulations. Uh, 
there is other work that um, Sujata presented to deal with those deficiencies in the, in the modeling, some really um, good work. I'm not presenting that here to, today, um, but that is a paper that is currently under review and we're definitely looking forward to see how, how the reviewer comments come back from that. But uh, the main conclusions from this work, the first two I've really focused on here, uh, the model metrics, can be deceiving. Uh, don't rely just on the Nash Sutcliffe or the log of the Nash. You really need to dig a little bit deeper to ensure that the model is is behaving uh, normally. And I know there's been some interesting work um, to uh, try and figure out how what sort of analysis is required to to do that. Um, and then the second bullet here is the meteorological data really does play a super important role in um, in the performance and um, it introduces the largest uncertainty or one of the largest uncertainties in the in the modeling chain, um, particularly for climate change simulations moving forward. Uh, these last two conclusions from the work, uh, you'll be able to see when the publication uh, eventually comes out, but the, um, just get a bit of a preview, the simulation of the future flows in the St. John River Basin illustrate or show that the winter flows are expected to increase and the summer flows are expected to decrease. And uh, the evaluation that they did of the model error indicated that there's higher confidence in the results for the winter flows increasing, but fairly low confidence in the results in terms of the summer flows decreasing. So there's some really nice work that uh, Sujata has done here to, um, uh, to move us forward with these production runs. And this is something that we're starting to put more emphasis on with some of the other basins that we're working on as well moving forward. Uh, the next basin I want to uh, talk about is the Great Lakes and uh, some of the work that Mazda is doing, um, and not just Mazda, but Chang and Dave Rudolph as well, uh, with respect uh, in particular to some of the improvements we're looking at with respect to uh, base flow uh, within um, mesh. Um, first of all, in terms of the motivation for focusing on the Great Lakes for groundwater, uh, this uh, slide, uh, uh, th this um, image here comes from a, a publication out of the U.S., which is why it only shows the U.S. portion of the, of the Great Lakes, but it really illustrates um, how important groundwater inputs are uh, in certain parts of the world and certainly in the Great Lakes. Um, just as an example, the estimate for Lake Michigan is that 75% of the inflows to Lake Michigan come from groundwater. And that doesn't mean it's coming directly from the groundwater to Lake Michigan, but it's feeding the groundwater, feeding the, the local streams that are, uh, that are eventually um, spilling into Lake Michigan. So given the importance of groundwater in, in, in these uh, areas, it's really critical that we improve how we represent groundwater in models like like mesh. It's a really important um, it's a really important process in terms of that surface water groundwater interaction, and we're exploring a number of different ways to to do this. Um, th this is an algorithm that um, uh, NASDA uh, is developing. Uh, it hasn't been implemented yet, but uh, this not going to go through all the details here, but just to illustrate that uh, we're looking at something that's a little more complex than what we currently have, but is not quite as complex as really fully coupling with the, with the groundwater model, which is something that we're uh, looking at with Chang and I'll be showing, um, showing shortly. This slide is one that I wanted to show really just to illustrate that what we are doing with all of the algorithms that we're developing is that we're doing it in a, what we're calling a model agnostic fashion. So we're developing them as individual modules that have links um, to mesh currently with this particular one. But uh, instead of baking it into the, the land surface scheme itself, the approach that we're taking allows it to be model agnostic. So it's much easier to uh, connect these, um, these new algorithms with, with other models. And that's something that we're doing on purpose here to ensure that um, uh, those connections can be made with, with the other models. Just moving on to some of the work that Chang is doing with, uh, with Dr. Rudolph. Um, here we're looking at um, uh, coupling more with uh, traditional groundwater model 
mod flow. And um, within the land or surface water, groundwater model coupling uh, world, there are different levels of coupling. There's loose coupling, there's tightly integrated coupling, or there's tight, tight coupling, and then there's fully integrated coupling. And we're not looking at doing a fully integrated coupling where everything is coupled uh, tightly, where all the equations are being um, calculated at the same time, and you've got super effective um, optimization algorithms for, for doing that. Uh, we're looking at more of a loose or a, a potentially a tight coupling. There's still some work to be done to uh, determine which is the best path forward here. Uh, but Chang is working on a small watershed uh, the Alder Creek watershed in southern Ontario. And um, the initial step really is to set up mesh in its current form and run the model to get some results. So uh, the hydrographs here that are shown on the right aren't, um, uh, they're not, they don't match super well to the, uh, to the observations, but there's been no work done to uh, do that or even really parameterize the model. The focus is just in getting the model to to run, and uh, that's actually happened in, in many ways in, in record time with the grid-based version that we're working with um, here. So uh, we've got two different streams that we're working on right now. The work that Chang is doing with coupling uh, with a uh, with full groundwater model and the work that NASDA is doing to improve the, um, the algorithms, the, the simpler algorithms that we're working with, but still more complicated than what we have been working in with in the, in the past. Chang's also been doing some other great work looking at freeze-thaw cycles, for example, and a number of other fronts, but I won't be showing those here today. As far as um, uh, the Saskatchewan River Basin goes, this is uh, the work that Fuad Yassin is, is doing, um, and uh, this is fairly mature work. Uh, the research questions that Fuad has been looking at are listed here. How much stream flow is generated in the in the in the different parts of the basin, the mountains, the prairies, boreal forests? Uh, what the distribution of stream flow generation is with respect to glacier melt, snow melt, rain on snow, rainfall runoff processes? How do the water budget components respond to droughts and floods or droughts in very wet years? And uh, how much irrigation water consumption is occurring in the basin, and how does this vary over? over time and space. And the work that Fuad's been doing has really um, been focused on helping to improve some of these uh, processes that MESH was uh, deficient in um, previously. Uh, glaciers, the representation of glaciers has been improved. It's not just Fuad who's been working on this, it's been in collaboration with a number of other people. Um, the blowing snow and transport and sublimation, uh, Fuad's really taken the lead on reservoir operations, irrigation, uh, for example, and also in using the existing algorithms that we have for non-contributing area dynamics and how to, uh, how and where to use those um, uh, non-contributing area dynamics focused on the PDM Roth algorithm that was developed um, in, uh, in 2014. So, uh, yet yeah, there's just a couple of animations here looking at uh, the precipitation runoff evaporation and um, and uh, and water storage in the in the basin uh, over time and uh, this is uh, really great work that, that Fuad is doing uh, again I just wanted to show some hydrographs everybody likes to look at, at hydrographs just uh, not uh, looking at statistics here, but I mean, there are a few statistics on the screen in terms of the AGEs, the, the Kunj uh, Gupta uh, efficiency criteria, but um, uh, just to give you a visual that the, uh, the model is uh, generally capturing the, uh, the stream flow observations uh, throughout the basin um, from a qualitative perspective. Um, there's a lot of other results that I could be showing here. I chose to uh, illustrate this one in particular. Um, this is an eco zone annual water balance uh, variability um, uh, slide. Uh, so you can see on the uh, on the far left box whisker plots, you've got the the uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration, and and runoff box whiskers for the entire basin as well as for some of the uh, the other areas and 
just as an example in the mountain cordillera here, uh, the runoff is a much more significant uh, portion of the precipitation uh, than in other parts for the prairies, for example. These runoff ratios are super low in the prairies and um, that has uh, implications for hydrological modeling, which really tends to stymie a lot of hydrological modelers and hydrological models. Um, uh, so there's some good work here to try and characterize what the uh, what the what the water balance um, components are for different parts of the the basin. And there is a paper in progress that Huad is working on to um, move that work forward. Um, moving on to some of the work that Logan is doing with uh, with CRIM, um, he's doing some research, uh, some climate change uh, research at the smaller scale, at the research scale for at Marmot Creek and at the river basin scale at the Bow River headwaters, looking at um, future changes in climate and glacier cover and the hydrology um, assessment of that. Uh, unlike the other forcing data products that I was mentioning before, uh, Logan has been using the pseudo global warming uh, product, which is something that is coming in the Anthings uh, shop uh, with the wharf model uh, representing the um, RCP 8.5 business as usual climate change scenario um, from the uh, IPCC. Uh, so uh, Logan was looking at a number of things. I'm just gonna show one uh, of the results here. So um, here we have for four different uh, locations in the, in the basin. This is for the Bow River headwaters. Uh, looking at the daily mean SWE for the uh, reference historical time period and comparing it to the um, uh, climate projections um, and showing that it looks like there's uh, going to be some changes to the snow water equivalent in the, um, in the basin under this business as usual um, uh, climate forcing scenario. Uh, so some great work happening there with uh, uh, with Logan. He's working on uh, two draft papers at the moment, improving the mountain hydrological predictions by better representing mountain topography and, and um, the hydrologic land surface models and diagnosing the runoff generation mechanisms under a changing climate for the, for the Bow River Basin. So getting uh, back to the larger scales again, here the Mackenzie River Basin and Mohammed El Shami has been doing some fantastic work in the Mackenzie River Basin. Um, he's also been providing a lot of support to the other modelers in the community alongside, uh, alongside ALA. Um, we've got a really great community of practice going on. Um, and I just want to show some of the results. I won't be showing any of the climate change results here, but um, that work is ongoing. Uh, in terms of the historic time periods, uh, comparing the model with um, uh, using the Wafti Gem Kappa as, as the forcing for a number of locations in the basin. Again, just a, a visual verification that uh, the model is behaving fairly well um, in a number of locations. And I know that was not the case when <laughs> we started with the basin. Uh, this was an extremely complicated basin, a lot of large lakes. Um, and very complex wetland hydrology that uh, um, Muhammad, and, and of course the, the frozen um, uh, permafrost regions and uh, discontinuous permafrost in some areas. These are uh, these are issues that Muhammad has been uh, has been looking at and um, making some great progress on uh, improving our ability to model in this basin. This slide here uh, really focuses on some of the different forcing data sets again. So the black line, the black line for each is the mean hydrographs for the period 2005 to 2016 for four different locations in the basin. And the colored lines represent the, um, uh, the model simulations for some of the, uh, these uh, forcing data products that we have available. So the yellow is the gem kappa. The red is the RDRS, and then the, the blue is the Wafti Gem Kappa. One difference here from what I was showing earlier in the St. John River Basin is that um, this was calibrated to Wafti Gem Kappa, and then that parameter set was used for um, with different the, the different forcing data sets. 
I would anticipate that if we calibrated this the, these areas to the RDRS that we would have improved results. But again, the problem there in terms of doing climate simulations into the future is that we don't necessarily have um, consistency with historic runs and future runs with something like the RDRS, whereas we do with, uh, with the Wafti Gem Kappa. Moving on um, to the Fraser Basin, this is some of the work that Al is doing. This is just a map of the basin and there's quite a number of gauges in, in this area. Um, Ala has done uh, some good work to, to set this basin up and uh, get it running, doing some initial um, runs and comparing the, uh, to different uh, sources of data that uh, give us an indication whether or not the model is functioning effectively. And in this case, this is a comparison of the total water storage coming from the mesh model uh, in comparison to the uh, GRACE uh, der derived um, satellite observations of total water storage. So uh, you can see that the model is uh, generally capturing these observations fairly, fairly well um, in this annual time step, uh, time step that we're looking at here. Uh, comparing to uh, the, the snow water equivalent to uh, a different estimate of snow water equivalent from our colleagues at Environment and Climate Change Canada in Montreal, the uh, Canadian Meteorological Centre or CMC. Uh, this shows that the two products again fairly um, closely resemble one another. Something's happening in that first year that it, and, and the third year, that first year is likely a, a spin up issue. Um, the mesh derived snow water equivalent tends to be higher than the CMC derived snow water equivalent, but the CMC uh, product is also an estimate, so it's entirely possible that the, uh, um, the, the CMC estimates are, are, are biased on the, on the negative side in terms of peaks we, um, but uh, the main take home message here for our purposes is that the model is generally behaving as we would expect it. To behave so there's some model fidelity there that um, is is suitable for the work that we're we're planning going forward uh, this slide shows um, the results of a number of different calibrations that um, ala did to uh, present bias looking at uh, it's not listed here but uh, just calibrating some of the land surface parameters try and get the evaporation rate and the total volumes correct in terms of stream flow for some of these different products. So we've got, um, well, we've got a number of different calibrations with the Wafti Gen Kappa and the RDRS. So each of these uh, lines in each plot uh, represents a different calibration. The yellow and the red at the end, uh, those last two there are with the RDRS and the others are a different um, parameterizations with the Wafti Gem Kappa. And each plot is for a different basin in the, uh, a different sub-basin of the, of the Fraser. So one thing to note here is for the first and the third basin in particular, the Wafti Gem Kappa reference run, uh, even though they've been calibrated to bias in part to these basins, have huge biases, 70% in the first case and in the third case, 120%. So that shows that for those subbasins, there are real issues with the forcing data inputs in those locations. And if you look for the, those same two basins, the first and the third again at the, um, at the RDRS, if um, the RDRS is the reference was using the RDRS with the parameterization from the calibrated Wafti Gem Kappa, you can see that there's an improvement there, but then when you actually calibrate to the RDRS, those biases drop down considerably. Um, so that gives us more confidence in the RDRS than, than we have in, um, in some of the other data sets like, like the Wafti Gem Kappa for certain locations. It varies from location to location. Um, and you can see that with some of these other, um, other plots here as well. The biases that you see for the second, third and fourth plots are not nearly as high for the first and third plots. For the Wafti Gem Kappa, they're maybe still a little higher than we would like, but uh, they're more reasonable, especially for that last basin there. If you have a bias of five percent or less, then uh, you're you're um, uh, you're doing uh, fairly well. 
And uh, in that case, the RDRS bias is actually a little bit worse. They've got a bias of, uh, of, of 10%. So it's, it's not uh, 100% across the board, but um, it's much easier to deal with bias of 10% on, on one sub watershed than it is to deal with the bias of 120% uh, on, on another watershed. So it just illustrates some of the challenges we have with the forcing data sets that we have to work with here. And, and there are ways of working around that, but um, it does mean that we have to be pretty systematic in how we do what we do with the uh, products that we have available to us. So I have talked about a number of model improvements. Um, there's a few others I would really like to highlight here as well. One uh, that Ala has been taking the lead on is um, really a game changer for us. We're calling this our vector-based uh, uh, project. And this is really changing mesh from being a grid-based model to what we're calling a vector-based or rather sub-watershed-based model using the Merit Hydro DEM as our, um, uh, as our, uh, as our sub-watersheds that we're, we're using for, for the model. Um, we did this work in collaboration with Martin Clark's group, particularly uh, with uh, Wouter and Shervan. Uh, working with Ala uh, closely and, and supplying him with their workflow um, diagrams and information. And um, this is a project that has gone very well. And the reason this is a game changer for us is that it really removes one of the uh, major problems with the mesh model in that setting up the model is a huge, huge pain. Um, it takes a long time. It uh, requires a lot of manual input uh, and decision making from the, the modeler, which means that for the grid based version of mesh, you could have two separate modelers setting up the same basin with the same information and you would essentially end up with two different models at the end of the day because those two modelers make different decisions. So this workflow um, really helps to streamline that process. Process It makes it a lot faster. It um, makes it a lot more consistent uh, from one person to the next in terms of the decisions that they, they have to make. And um, just as an example, something that previously would have taken maybe two months to set up can be set up in two days or something that previously took two days to set up can be done in two hours with this. Um, so it's not... Uh, it's been tested um, on a couple of basins, but it hasn't received uh, widespread use just yet. We're still kind of in the testing and phases here. Um, we're close. We're, I'd say we're at the end of the testing phases here uh, and ready to roll this out. But we have momentum in the work that we have been doing with the grid-based version that we need to continue get some publications out with those before we fully switch over to the vector-based version of the of the model. This just shows um, a comparison between the observations and the grid-based version of MeSH versus the vector-based version of MeSH. And there are some differences, but they're easily explained as to why there are differences. And this, these are the results for the Bow River at Banff, which is where Al uh, did his test initially and then uh, retested uh, for his Fraser setup. So he's got a grid-based and a vector-based setup for the Fraser. And, um, it, it went much, much faster with the vector-based and the results are uh, comparable between the vector-based and the grid-based and any differences are easily explained. One of the other things that I think is a game changer for the work that we're doing is some work that Mohammed Ahmed is doing. And um, this is uh, somebody who is not funded through the, the core modeling, but is a, a part, has been working collaboratively with us. And this is um, some work again that's happening Fairly quickly, uh, Muhammad is uh, incorporating Kevin Shook's uh, HGDM hysteretic and gatekeeping de depression model into both mesh and height. And uh, we had a code review of the mesh code the other day with a number of people, including including Kevin. And um, it's it's really nice to see. There's a very uh, clean code. Muhammad's done a great job of pulling that together. Um, there's still a bit of work to to do. Um, within MeSH on the coding front, but uh, the, the physics is, is in there and that's something that we need to start testing and publishing fairly, fairly soon. Um, as far as the implementation goes, the, the work that 
has been done, it, it discretizes each grid only into two grouped response units, an upland, um, an upland response unit and a water depression response unit. So the runoff is generated by the upland GRU and the runoff is a combination of the surface runoff and interflow from all of the soil layers. Um, the uh, uh, precip or evaporation into the water or depressional GRU is handled there. Uh, and then uh, Kevin Chook's model calculates the outflow in the contributing area at the, at the grid scale. And then um, the uh, water fraction in that grid can be dynamically updated. And again, as with some of the other algorithms I've mentioned, uh, we're doing this in a model agnostic framework so that um, it can be easily incorporated into other models. I say easily, I should say more easily incorporated. It really depends on um, uh, having the person with the right skills to, to do that work. Um, but uh, it's way, way easier if, if we develop these algorithms um, independently of the, uh, the models that we want to couple them with. Okay, so there's some, some dynamics there. Um, so this is also has been implemented in, uh, in, in Hype. Um, and uh, and this is just a schematic and a few bullet points uh, illustrating that. Um, as far as the current status of this work goes, uh, the coding of the physics is done. There's still a little bit of coding in mesh with respect to uh, tying it into the, the mesh infrastructure and moving from two GRUs to multiple GRUs. Uh, it has been tested um, within hype on a, on a test watershed with hypothetical precipitation and it is um, working as is as we would expect it to work. Uh, the code with hype has been transferred to our colleagues in Sweden at SMHI um, for further quality control and quality, quality assurance. It's good to have other people looking at the work and testing it out and making sure that things um, work as expected. Entirely possible that people are going to find some some bugs or whatever, but that's what the that's what the the process is is for, so that that inf information can be fed back to the uh, to the people developing the the code. In this case, um, uh, it's Muhammad. So the code within Mesh is still being uh, revised, and we're moving into a, a testing phase in a very short order. As I mentioned, we'll be incorporating more than two upland uh, or two GRUs total, um, more than one upland GRU so that it can be uh, generalized a little bit more. And uh, there is work on a manuscript that will be um, started very soon. And again, this is work that is happening very, very quickly. Um, it really only started a couple of months ago. Uh, so it's really good to see how things are, are progressing. Um, the third bullet, uh, that I'd really like to highlight, and, and, and this, when I say the third bullet, in one of my initial slides, that the the the, um, the three goals of our group in terms of climate change production runs, improving the physics in the current generation models, and uh, providing support to the GWF community. Um, this is a slide that just illustrates some of the support that's being provided. Um, it's not just ALA, it, we really do have a community of practice. Everybody pitches in and helps everybody on, on, our, on our Slack channels. Um, and uh, I, there's no way I can keep up with all, all the activity happening on all the, all the Slack channels, but it is really great to see that it is happening. Um, and uh, I know, uh, everybody's been pitching in. ALA and Muhammad in particular have been really supporting a lot of people. Um, so. The support comes in the form of helping people set up and troubleshoot their models. Uh, if you're trying to do this on your own and you run into a problem, sometimes you just get stuck uh, and you just need somebody else to uh, who's either had the same problem or, or, or can look at things from a different perspective to help you work through them. So we do have that uh, community of practice. Um, there's the work been uh, collaboratively, collaboratively between GWF and ECCC and other parts of GWF uh, in uh, developing the, um, the algorithms and the improvements to the models. Uh, there's also been some great support in terms of 
uh, figuring out the best path forward for publishing our, our model configurations and uh, the results from our model runs and that work is on ongoing. But um, I think we're moving past the days where uh, you publish a paper and then that's it. And nobody, even yourself, cannot replicate what you've done in that paper by publishing the model configurations and the results and even the scripts that are used to produce the figures in those publications, um, that, that really uh, makes the work that we're doing much more transparent, much more uh, repeatable, much more able to pass what we're now calling the lottery test. We used to call it bus test and the bus test uh, is replaced with the lottery test because it's much more positive. If somebody wins the lottery and they are no longer with us, uh, then uh, somebody else can much more easily come along and pick up that work and, and take it the, the step further. Uh, there's also been uh, quite a bit of support in coordinating between ECCC and GWF with respect to the various code versions that are being developed. Um, and we're being much more systematic about how we're developing the code moving forward and testing the code, uh, the new releases. We just released a new version of the model today and um, uh, we're looking forward to uh, testing that. We have done some tests on a number of basins and we're looking forward to others who are working with Mesh in particular uh, to um, see what, uh, what they find in terms of how it works or any issues that they run into. And then our documentation is really shifting to our wiki page and um, there's uh, some support that's been happening there to ensure that not only the current gen team um, members are able to take advantage of all the advancements that are taking place, but anybody in the, in the modeling community uh, working, with, um, working with the models uh, to uh, go beyond just having them look at the code, look at the publications to figure stuff out. Uh, we are putting in some emphasis on the, uh, on the documentation so that we can make the most effective use of the people who are using the models and testing them out so they don't have to recreate the wheel and refigure everything out every time they, they run the model. This is something that is often neglected. Nobody likes to document. Um, it's not a fun job. Uh, but it's something that we have to do to ensure that we're working as efficiently and effectively as possible moving forward. So uh, just to summarize um, from our three bullets, uh, we are really making good progress on our climate change production runs. I think we're getting to the point where we're starting to um, pick up the pace um, with, with respect to that, which is good. Uh, there's been quite a focus over the last number of months and there continues to be a focus on model improvements in a number of areas which I've covered um, in this talk today, not only with MESH but also with CRIM and, and HYPE. I've been more focused on the, um, in this presentation on the improvements to MESH. And uh, we've got a great community of practice and really good um, support mechanisms in place for current generation model users um, within the GWF community. And that spills it outside of the GWF community as well um, for those that would be running the model um, outside and certainly within the ECCC as well. So um, with that, I would like to thank you for your time. And um, hopefully I, I gave you a good update there in terms of what the current gen modeling team is doing. And I'm certainly hoping, open to answering any questions. And if you have a question I can't answer because I don't know the details as well as the HQP, I might call on some of the HQP to respond. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, that was a super presentation. We'll be now moving towards the Q&A session. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Sherwan and he says, a great talk and nice to see all the nice things coming together. Uh, just wanted to point out, as it might be interest for audience, that uh, there's a new package called EasyMore that Sharon has developed, and then EasyMore can handle the change of forcing uh, resolution over the time. And as, a, as an example, if one data set with specific uh, resolution is not available, uh, switching to a new data set or resolution would be just a matter of minor changes in EasyMore setting, and no need is needed for the model setup. 
So uh, particularly for forcing data. So if you have forcing data in different uh, spatial resolutions or different uh, uh, different geometry, then with the easy more you can uh, easily use that. So that could be a very handy tool for all the current gen uh, more or less who is trying to you know uh, get the forcing data for their patient. So uh, you can have a look at the easy more. Uh, yes, second, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Sherva. Yeah, there's there's so much going on right now. It's really. Um, that, that I really appreciate that comment, Shervin, so thank you for that. Uh, this is a quick comment from Al saying, thanks, Bruce, uh, nicely done. Thank you, Al. And we have another we have question from, uh, from, it's an anonymous question. So uh, thanks for the presentation, Bruce. Uh, you showed a comparison of total basin water from MES with GRACE data for the Fraser River Basin. Is this something that a model could be calibrated to, or is it the best to stick with stream flow for calibration and use the GRACE data as a validation tool? That's an excellent question. And um, my view is it really depends on what you're trying to answer um, or what question you're looking at. Um, it could be used for both, either with calibration or as a validation or, or calibration and validation. Um, I think the, uh, the, what I was showing for the Fraser draws upon some of the work that Allah did really as a part of his PhD. So he has everything readily available in terms of being able to do those comparisons. And as I was putting together this presentation, I think one of the things that I would like to um, uh, push our current generation team to do is make use of the tools and scripts that Allah ha has developed so that we can do that with some of the other basins. In some cases, it's a little harder, like the uh, Great Lakes, for example, uh, or the Great Lakes in the in the Mackenzie. Uh, I'm not sure how that impacts the the ability to do a, a fair comparison with the with the Grace observations, as an example. But um, I think we should be making use of uh, whatever data sets we have available and um, going beyond stream flow to still water equivalent, uh, whatever might be available in soil moisture. And GRACE is, uh, is, is a good example of something that we should be making better use of in the work that we're doing going forward. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I also remember uh, earlier research Fuad did, and I think Surat also did yes. in uh, Brightwater Creek, where they use uh, Fuad use uh, grace data, and so they use the in in uh, in situ soil moisture data to constrain the model, and I think they found that it was helpful. The model fidelity was more improved when the uh, data like it was constrained with additional data like uh, soil moisture data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and thanks for pointing that out. I mean, uh, Fuad did some great work a few years ago. Uh, looking at that question specifically, and uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It increased the model fidelity um, in the in the Saskatchewan. So, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely that's something that we should probably bring more of our attention to going forward for, for some of these other bases. And I'll just add it that we should develop a plan for using GRACE data, and J, uh, our director for the GIWS has also agreed to help with that. Okay, perfect, great, yeah. Uh, yeah. The next question is from Curtis. Uh, a great presentation. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, can you provide some timeline on the extension of the RDRS uh, back to 1980? I think that's how far back you said it will eventually go. Uh, also, if Casper is the best place to assess that data. Uh, thanks again. Curtis, that is a great question. I, and unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. I don't know that. We can... Um, we can look into that for sure. I, I do know that, um, that they are, our colleagues in Montreal are working on it. And um, I, I'm also very eager to see that, that happen. Um, and I, I'd love to have that yesterday rather than tomorrow. It's, as far as I understand from my colleagues, it's, it's a bit difficult to, um, to, to provide a, a timeline. Um, and timelines that we've had in the past uh, haven't always been met. So uh, all I can say right now is we do continue to work on it. Keep asking that question and um, you know, feel free to follow up with me directly and I can, I can ask the question internally uh, to our colleagues in Montreal and see what their thinking is around the, the timelines. I also feel like the more the stakeholder and end user asks for the data, there may be more uh more speed up process at the at the ECC end. We can, uh, yeah, we can 
I agree. Yeah, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So <laughs> this is a wheel worth uh, worth squeaking, I think. And and with regards to Casper, I'll uh, note it that the Casper will be the platform to to assess the data. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Alan. Um, just not uh, just a quick question. Uh, you also mentioned about that, and I was reading one paper from 2019 from GenStack, and they were looking at the publications in water resource and hydrology, and they look around 2,000 publications, and they found that only up to 6.8 percent of those publications could be reproduced. So, can you talk a little bit about the you know need for the version control for models and model runs and for the model transparency, transparency and reproducibility? And you have been advocating it for a long time, but you know, what is the current progress and you know what plans you have for that? Yeah, I um, yeah, this is something that's really important in my mind, and it's something that has traditionally always fallen by the wayside. Um, it's hard to get funding for that specific thing. Uh, I remember a presentation in Saskatoon a number of years ago by Dennis Lentmeyer, um, and he he said the same the same thing. This was maybe 10 years ago now. Um, and uh, yeah, this is in my mind, this is where software engineering really comes in. And that's what I call it. Other people call it different things. There's there's different names for it in different um, communities of practice. But um, I mean, certainly for many, many years now, we've been having a pretty consistent version control with, with the mesh model. Uh, we are switching the platforms that we're working with from Subversion to GitHub because that is, uh, is more um, prevalent now. And uh, the, the tools that are available in GitHub are better um, uh, from what I can see than they are in, in Subversion at the moment. And uh, some of the other things that we're starting to incorporate, um, I mentioned that we're being more systematic in how we're releasing versions of the code now. And we just released a version yesterday. Uh, this is where I think some of my work as a public servant with the federal government comes in handy because there is uh, way too much bureaucracy in a lot of the work I do, but this is where I think we can bring in the right amount of bureaucracy for, for the academic community to um, ensure that we're documenting the decisions that we're making in terms of uh, developing the requirements for the next version of the model in a way that somebody can follow in the, in the future and then actually following through on, on those developments um, in a timely fashion. Uh, the other aspect of it is not, it's not just keeping track of our code, it's keeping track of our model runs and the outputs from the model runs and if somebody's publishing something, chances are they've used Python or R scripts um, to produce uh, plots in those publications. In my view, those are all things that should be stored in a GitHub, which is published alongside with the publication itself uh, so that the work is much more easily reproducible. And I know a lot of the journals are asking for these sorts of things more and more. So. The advantage for the researcher is that you have something else that you can point to as a, as a separate publication, um, even though it's not really a, like a full journal article, it's a publication of a model run or, um, or a data set. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I'll just give a few seconds for, for anybody to have, you know, if they have any last question. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I have just a Quick question for you, and I, I know it's going to be hard uh, to answer as well. Is do you have some timeline on when all the current gen production runs uh, will be available? Any like target time date or anything like that? Uh, not off the top of my head. Um, we will be moving on the production runs for the for the Mackenzie and the Saskatchewan uh, because those are the basins that have are the furthest ahead in terms of the modeling. Um, the work that is is taking place on the on the Fraser and the Mackenzie, for example, or, or sorry, not the the Fraser and the Great Lakes. Um, that work is only recently started, and and the Columbia as well. So, um, the the next two basins that we're going to knock off are the are the Mackenzie and the um, uh, and the Saskatchewan, uh, but Muhammad and and uh, Fuad are also. Uh, juggling a number of responsibilities as well. So I don't have a timeline other than to say that those are the next two basins that we plan on getting publications outdoor for. 
and I expect shortly after we will be uh, pushing for publications around the uh, around the around the, the other basins that we we haven't um, uh, we've been focusing on setting up the models for. So, kind of a loose answer to your your question, but time time is running out for sure. So we need to we need to move fast. Um. I don't see any more questions, so I think we'll move to the formal closure of this webinar. Uh, thank you, Bruce. And I also want to thank everyone that attended this webinar. Uh, the video recording will be available later today in Core Modeling website. And just a note that next month we'll be having Dr. Julie Theo from the University of Quebec at Montreal, uh, who will be presenting on advances in special metrological forcing data. So please stay tuned. Uh, that will be all for today. Uh, any last comment, Bruce? No, just again, thank you to everybody who attended the call today, and I'm um, really looking forward to uh, presenting uh, next time this series comes around. So thank you. All right. Uh, thank you all. Uh, please stay safe. Wish you a good day. Okay. Bye, everybody.